Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. The family of that slain T.A. Thompson student speaks out. MPs weigh in on the murder of a teenage boy. The social services minister weighs in on the killing of a teenage boy. News is brought to you by Alive. Best. Welcome to Our News and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. Blue Kai and Renewal Holdings Limited signed a letter of intent with Royal Caribbean Cruises and the ITM Group today for the purchase of the Grand Blue Kai Resort on Grand Bahama for $65 million and the redevelopment of the Freeport Harbor. The Board of Directors of Lucan Renewal Holdings Limited unanimously approved a resolution to recommend to the Cabinet the sale of the Grand Lucan Resort to Royal Caribbean and TCL on March 22nd. With more on this, here's Vonnie Toot. Today's LOI signing comes six months after the sale of the Grand Lucayne Resort to government became effective. According to the Office of the Prime Minister, the proposed joint venture project between RCL-ITM will include the redevelopment of the Grand Lucayne Resort into a world-class destination, featuring water-based family entertainment with dining, gaming and entertainment options and five-star hotel accommodations. Meanwhile, the redevelopment of the Freeport Harbor is anticipated to result in a significant increase in cruise ship arrivals, drawing an additional 2 million passengers annually to Grand Bahama. This is an incredible um, uh, accomplishment and announcement. Um, the government has entered and uh, signed a letter of intent uh, to negotiate a heads of agreement and a purchase agreement for the sale of the Grand Lucayan property. Um, we feel that this is um, uh, a very exciting because we have delivered on a promise. Uh, we said to the Bahamian people that come along with us, we're going to buy this hotel for 65 million because we firmly believe that we can sell it on onward to someone else uh, and we have managed to sell it onward to someone for $65 million. Officials say phase one of the proposed development represents a projected $195 million investment over a 24-month period. Approximately 2,000 jobs are expected to be created in the first phase of the project. The Board of Directors of Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited unanimously approved the resolution to recommend to Cabinet the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort to RCL on March 22nd. And this is a great group. Um, of course, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines is a huge company, uh, well-funded, have an excellent um, track record. So I want you to think of this like Disney. When you go to Orlando, you don't go there for the hotel, you go there for the park. So we had to build an attraction. We had to give people a reason to grow, go to Grand Bahama. Just yesterday, D'Aguilar told reporters that Lucayan's chairman Michael Scott's claim that a preferred bidder for the Grand Lucayan will likely be named this week was a little premature. We asked him about that. Well, I just didn't want to, um, um, you know, we were still in the negotiations. Uh, we didn't know um, exactly, uh, I mean, I had a good idea what was going to happen, but, you know, I wanted to create a sense of excitement. I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to uh, not let the cat out of the bag and uh, you know what there could have been a twist to turn at the very end so I didn't want to uh, um, I wanted to manage expectations and so um, you know uh, I, I was pretty sure this was going to happen but you know let everything happen in time. Lucayan Renewal Holdings is a special purpose vehicle board established by government to handle the process of finding a buyer for the troubled property. Government purchased the resort last year for $65 million with $30 million paid up front. Government officials have said they hope to sell the resort by the end of the second quarter. We asked the tourism minister if that deadline still stands. You have a period of due diligence and then you have um, a period of negotiation at the heads of agreement um, and then you have time to close the deal and uh, all of those will um, take a number of months 
um, so the specifics of which I don't really want to, 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 to get into, but um, um, to me, we're on the journey to a sale. And, uh, and we did it before the end of March. Uh, when the deal actually closes will be a subject of negotiations and, and you know, what twists and turns happen along the way. But we uh, certainly hope to have uh, the deal done if not by the second quarter, the third quarter um, of, of this year. Reporting for our news, I'm Vonique Tude. All right, thanks, Vonique. Well, the mother of a 15-year-old T.A. Thompson student who was stabbed to death on Tuesday is speaking out. Gladys Lewis says her son was constantly bullied and Tuesday's stabbing incident was a tragic ending to constant violent attacks her son was forced to endure. Jared Higgs reports. I love him and he loved me. I know he loved me. I was never there to protect him. <laughs> I wasn't there when he called on me. I wasn't there. <laughs> Thirty-eight-year-old Gladys Lewis was inconsolable as she described her relationship with her fifteen-year-old son, Perry Roll Jr. How you expect me to feel? You know, that's my only son. I love him, but he loved me no longer than the night before. He's playing with me, hugging me, kissing me. You know, I was a single mother. I tried with my child. I was struggling with my son from day one. According to police reports, it was shortly after 3 p.m. on Tuesday when Roll Jr. and another teen boy got into an altercation on Pitt Road, Chippingham. Officers say the situation escalated with the other boy producing a knife and stabbing Roll Jr. He was taken to hospital where he later died. That student was taken into custody shortly after with video of the arrest reportedly captured on a nearby camera. It was protective of them. 15-year-old Perry had two younger sisters, aged 10 and 8 years old. His mother told Our News that her son was constantly bullied by boys attending the nearby C.C. Sweeting Senior High School. She says Tuesday's incident was the third assault of its kind. The first time they won't, he got stabbed in his arm. Uh, then the next attack, they attack him. They attack him and they stab him on his eyes. I took my son out of school. I said, oh, I tell him, you know, I can't take T.A. no more. The grieving mother says teachers at T.A. Thompson did all they could to intervene, but it wasn't enough. She says she disciplined her son and spoke to him about the company he kept. However, the constant attacks and bullying led her son to arm himself. When I go in his pocket and stuff, I'll find little, little minor weapons and stuff on him, like, you know, but I would t take him from him because I don't want him to hurt nobody else's kid. But he's telling us, how about them hurting me, mommy? In a bid to keep her son safe, Lewis says her plan was to send her 15-year-old to live with family in Orlando, Florida. It was a move she says her son had agreed to. I just was waiting for him to take his exams, the TA, so I could, I wasn't even sending him to the senior side. I was planning on sending him somewhere else. Now over at the TA Thompson Junior School, the screams and sobs of students were loud and clear from news reporters who were in a gallery area near the office. We weren't actually allowed to go into the school's assembly. However, it was clear that the students were extremely sad. Roll's mother says a girl who witnessed the incident says she begged her son's killer not to hurt him. The little girl, when she come to tell me my child got stabbed yesterday, she says she plead to the boy. She plead to him and tell him, don't do it, don't do it. Say, I would give you my money. I would pay you not to hurt him. And the boy still stabbed my child and kill him. Roll's aunt, Lisa Delholm, wants her nephew's killer to feel the full brunt of the law. He did his act as a big grown adult. He should be um, penalized as a big grown adult. And while Roll's mother sobbed for her oldest child, she was able to reflect on better memories. Good memories was my son loved me. We joked together. We played together, you know. Sometimes I row him. He don't take it seriously. Sometimes I, you know, I punish him. Whatever it is I do to him, he still show me, you know, mommy, I love you, you know, you know, he's always affectionate. Tuesday's killing brought the country's murder count for the year to 18. Reporting for our news, I am Jared Higgs. Well, in the wake of that killing, Education Minister Jeff Floyd is insisting that the nation's public schools are safe. His comments came after his visit to T.A. Thompson Junior High. Well, our schools are very safe. These are safe school campuses. This incident did not happen on the campus. 
This is a community misfortune. And let's be very clear about this. The school is a representative of the microcosm of the realities that students must face on a daily basis. Lloyd offered this reaction to yesterday's stabbing incident. And I am disappointed. Uh, obviously, I am in deep regret that this school, led by Mr. Andrew Dean, principal, and his wonderful and dedicated and committed staff, must uh, endure this day um, a broken spirited community. Lloyd says he is advised that there are significant issues with students at T.A. Thompson, T.G. Glover, and C.C. Sweeting. He urged the wider community, in particular adults, to set a better example for young people. I also ask our stakeholders, and I'm talking particularly about the parents and our community, to engender a sense of harmony and peace and love in our young people. But that cannot happen unless they see this in us adults, because children learn what they live. Well, proceedings in the House of Assembly got off to a somber star this morning as members of Parliament weighed in on the teen's tragic murder. While several MPs sent heartfelt condolences to his family, Englishton MP Glennis Hen Martin revealed she once had an encounter with a teen who lived in her constituency. Jasmine Brown reports. Hannah Martin was one of several MPs to speak about Roll's death, and while her speech was short, it was also powerful as she labeled the teen's murder an unspeakable tragedy. We could claim as politicians we have this, that, great, wonderful, and all these things, but at the end of the day, we have to come to terms with what is actually happening on the ground in our country, and we have to come together as a people to address and redress the the challenges that we're facing, especially amongst children. When you see this happening to children, Mr. Speaker, you know that we are going, we are, we are, we are in experiencing um, something that is, that's a very um, serious phenomenon. Hannah Martin insisted that while many are pointing fingers, there is one thing that is certain, that it's time to put aside politics. This is speaking very terribly to what is happening in our country with our young people. And it requires all hands on deck. It is not a political issue. It's not a police issue. The police have a very limited role. I know that of recent, we seem to think that the police are the panacea. They're not. They have one role. They're law enforcement. And then in urban renewal, they're supposed to have some proactivity in prevention. But it's a much deeper, wider issue than the police. And Hannah Martin did not stop there as she pointed out she was opposed to school policing. However, she says given the recent spate of violence among school kids, she has been forced to rethink her stance. I feel sorry to say this because I'm one of those people to speak. I didn't really support the police in the schools. I didn't support that. <laughs> you know, but I think we have to find a way to ensure that children are safe going to and from school. It's a human right to access education without being killed. In addition to Hannah Martin's impassioned pleas, National Security Minister Marvin Dames and Transport and Local Government Minister Renward Wells also sent condolences to the family. It's a tragedy both for the victim and the perpetrators of the act because henceforth they will be forever branded with such an incident. But Mr. Speaker, I want to say to the family that, and I know it's very difficult to make this statement at this time that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot cure. I too join in solidarity with my parliamentary colleagues and offering my condolences to the family, teachers, staff, and students at the T.A. Thompson School on the passing of a son, a student, a classmate, and a friend. I pray that this tragic incident serve as a reminder to all of us that violence affects us all. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Members of Parliament debating the Road Traffic Amendment Bill in the House of Assembly today. Contributing to the debate was National Security Minister Marvin Dames, who insisted the changes are needed to make the streets of the Bahamas safer. 
Last year, there were 63 traffic fatality accidents, which represented a 29% increase over 2017. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, resulting from the 63 traffic fatality accidents, with the untimely demise of 69 traffic victims, which, which reflected a 28% increase from the previous year. Of the traffic fatality victims by island, 42 of the fatalities occurred on the island of New Providence, 11 on the island of Grand Bahama, and 10 on the remaining family islands. The Road Traffic Amendment Bill was tabled in September 2018 and seeks to criminalize the use of cell phones and other electronic communication devices while driving, along with making it illegal to drive with open alcoholic beverages. It also allows for motorists to take a left turn on a red light. The bill would also make the failure of a driver to produce his or her name and address, the name and address of the owner of the motor vehicle or certificate of motor insurance in respect of that motor vehicle a criminal offense. It would make a driver's failure to produce a driver's license on request of a uniformed police officer an offense, which could lead to an arrest. The bill will also require the payment of outstanding fines in respect of traffic offenses before the granting of a driver's license or a public service driver's license. Former Transport and Aviation Minister Glennis Hannah Martin says while the opposition agrees with some aspects of the bill, it does not support others. We believe behavior changes can be achieved with more rational fines and vigilant enforcement. We differed from the prior administration on fines for the failure to wear seatbelts and made comparisons with other jurisdictions and our fines to, were, were found to be out of whack and unduly high. On taking office, we subsequently amended the level of fines and I think we will agree that by and large, I think the police will tell us there is compliance. Speaker. Still to come on our news, a serious issue takes center stage next month. Plus, 300 officers will be present at the Buju Banton concert. Stay tuned.